My first two videos about World War I were really focused on the chronology of the conflict and how the events unfolded from the origins to the ending of the Great War. Lesson 2 will be a different approach as it will focus on how this great conflict also strongly involved not only the soldiers but the civilians and in fact the societies in general. Uh, for this purpose I need to introduce a concept which is very important and that's the concept of total war. A total war is a war who involves all the components of the society in the conflict both actively as we will have a mobilization of many forces in the civilian society and also negatively in the sense that society will be um, affected and will suffer will be changed by uh, the effect of the war and clearly the first world war was also the first total war in uh, modern history and I believe in history in general. So the first point will be about how societies were actively mobilized and uh, later we will speak about the suffering of the civilians and the way they faced um, violence. So about mobilization of societies Point A will be about um, the role civilians could play and how the state really took a um, leadership uh, and uh, a much more larger scope of action in times of war uh, when it came to controlling society and the economy. Uh, in English there is an expression for that, it's big government. The idea that, uh, contrary to what had been done so far uh, throughout the 19th century, it was time for government, because of necessity, not to only focus on questions of police and legislation, but really to have a much stronger control and management of society, with one goal, to win the war. The first point we need to have a look at is uh, how mobilization of civilians was quick in order to turn men into soldiers. Of course there is a difference uh, between France and Britain here because France had a compulsory military service and a system of conscription which means that when the war was declared millions of men were technically ready and also administratively ready to be mobilized, to be sent on the front lines or at least uh, stationed in reserve uh, wearing their uniform. In total for France 8, eight million soldiers will uh, wear the uniform during the war. So it was really a, an almost universal mobilization of uh, men from 18 to 40 years old uh, during this conflict. But in Britain the situation was pretty different because Britain only had a professional army and uh, consequently there was a strong need for a massive and successful recruitment campaign when the war broke out in 1914. Uh, the British Army was ready for uh, colonial wars, the Navy was very strong, but in numbers of soldiers the British Army was totally outnumbered by the French, which was not a problem, but by the Germans as well. And so a campaign of propaganda was launched by the government as soon as uh, the war started in the summer of 1914. And there is no poster which can summarize in a better way this propaganda campaign than this one. It's an extremely famous poster which also inspired all other posters for recruitment 
uh, in, uh, in uh, later history, in particular in the USA. And so it shows uh, uh, the main general of the British Army, Lord Kitchener. We already mentioned him when talking about colonial wars and in particular his great idea of creating concentration camps in South Africa during the Boer Wars. Uh, by the way, there is a, a famous remark that was made by an historian about Kitchener. He said he was not a great man, but it, he was a great poster. And indeed, Kitchener nowadays is mostly remembered for showing his face and big moustache and his finger pointing at the viewer of this poster, saying, Britons, Kitchener wants you. Join your country's army. So uh, that that um, was, of course, not the only argument, authority, that was used by propaganda, but it was part of a very successful propaganda campaign because 2.6 million volunteers accepted to uh, enlist uh, in 1914 and 1915. And in fact, propaganda used other um, arguments to convince young men. They largely talked about the atrocities committed by the German army in Belgium. Uh, we call that the rape of Belgium in history. A bit later, they would also use the um, sinking of the Lusitania ocean liner uh, as uh, a proof that fighting against the Germans was something that had to be done for moral reasons. And another characteristic of this recruitment campaign was uh, that in order to encourage people, they were promised that they would fight alongside their friends and relatives. Indeed, it was promised that battalions of new recruits would be organized according to uh, a uh, geographic pattern. One city will have its battalion. Sometimes uh, uh, people from the same football club were told they would fight together. Or people from the same school, for example, you can see here, uh, a proof that uh, all social classes were involved. Uh, students from the famous um, school of Eton, one of the most prestigious um, school in uh, for the English uh, elite and aristocracy, that are training here. And so uh, probably uh, they were aimed to form uh, what was called a PALS battalion. Uh, PAL is another word for friend. And so this system of PALS battalions was really a key of the success of the British propaganda campaign. Again, 2.6 million men accepted to volunteer. All social classes, I said, and here you can see uh, working class men uh, on their first day of uh, recruitment and then here training. So the British army uh, for two years trained uh, many men who had not done a military service because contrary to France that was not compulsory. And in fact by the middle of the war by 1916 this system of uh, volunteering was abandoned uh, for several reasons. First of all because the number of volunteers was dropping and uh, the need for troops, uh, on the contrary, was uh, constantly growing because many dead and wounded soldiers had to be replaced. You call dead and wounded soldiers casualties. Uh, moreover, uh, the battlefields, the, the front lines, were always more and more numerous and so a wider deployment of troops uh, was needed as war intensified. Uh, moreover, the volunteer system was damaging Britain's production system. Uh, indeed, uh, some workers enlisted massively, notably the miners, and uh, we may understand why, because uh, the miners were um, characterized by a strong sense of solidarity, uh, a sense of their community of miners. And so, of course, the, the recruitment campaign was very successful in this type of community, as in other type of uh, factory jobs. But uh, 
skilled workers uh, were necessary for um, uh, having the economy running and they had to provide for the war effort at home so uh, as um, some um, some workers had to be sent back on what was called the home front well it was uh, another reason for uh, choosing a compulsory system and so that's why in 1916 uh, like in France uh, a conscription system which means that you were uh, forced to join the army when you were called was organized in Britain and the last reason why it was organized finally in 1916 was that the cost the social and moral cost of the volunteer system was really really too high due to what the violence of World War One was like for example in the previous video I talked about the Battle of the Somme and the fact that on the first day of the Battle of the Somme thousands of soldiers died in one day well because of the system of pals battalions it was sometimes an entire town that had lost most of its young men and so morally speaking that was absolutely unacceptable the casualties were not evenly distributed over the country and so that's also for this reason that the system of recruitment was changed in Britain second point the economic mobilization uh, World War I was not only a war between uh, two armies or more than two of course uh, and uh, the, the bravest or the, 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 the one with the best strategy would win no World War I was more than uh, many wars of the past a war between two economic systems and so producing as much supply as possible in terms of guns of ammunition but also of uniforms of transport of food was something absolutely key to victory and so uh, it became clear from the end of 1914 that the war would be long so supplying the armies became the central issue and the government had to play an active role in order to ensure that the economy could meet the demands of the military which were inexorably growing we can see on this graph how much uh, the share of public spending so money spent by the government in the national uh, GDP increased uh, in the countries that fought the war Germany, France and the UK, they all saw a sharp rise in their national spending while the USA started to do the same when it joined the war at the end of 1916. So in the meantime, that's an example with the UK here, the debt of the government increased as well because y you had to uh, use money um, uh, that you could not produce so uh, the government uh, could, not on, could not only rely on taxation during the war it had to uh, ask banks for money and also uh, individual people and so in order to finance the war effort in all countries that fought the war public loans were launched to get money from the citizens uh, you could find posters calling for citizens to uh, uh, spend their money, their money on the war effort in, in any country but I chose this poster from France where it is uh, what is demanded to uh, the viewer of the poster is to um, to put some money uh, to in the bank Société Générale and that money would be used for um, uh, for the war effort and people would only be paid back uh, at the end of the war it's an interesting poster because uh, you can see that uh, the arguments that are used uh, in the drawing are really um, uh, moral and effective uh, arguments because we we have here uh, the image of a family in which the the father uh, is uh, at least at war but what we feel because the drawing is really brilliant and because of the title talking about the horrors of war that probably the father has died so that was the kind of propaganda campaigns that were organized in order to call for a, a massive uh, financial involvement of the citizens 
Large amounts of money were also borrowed to other countries, and in particular the USA, which really became what we can call the creditors of the Allies. That is to say that the USA acted like a kind of bank for uh, uh, its allied countries, France and Britain in particular, uh, which also implied that um, uh, France and Britain owed something to the USA, which in terms of geopolitics was very important. People were also asked to ask responsibly. Uh, nowadays, in 2020, uh, we are often told by uh, public propaganda to uh, have a uh, uh, an economical attitude regarding the way we consume uh, for matters of um, uh, protection of the environment. Well, during wartime, rationing was sometimes organized, which means that some products were not freely available, but rationed, and so for food in particular, uh, only uh, small amounts of food could be distributed to the people every day. That was a way to prevent uh, uh, the possibility of a shortage in food or any other important product. And so with this poster we can see another example of a very very important raw material during the war which was coal. Well of course coal is useful and was in those days useful to almost every dimensions of production uh, from the production of electricity to uh, the, the necessity of um, burning coal in factories uh, to have the, the machines work. And uh, coal was also used at home uh, in many British cities uh, as a, a source of heating. So uh, on this poster you can read uh, that if for everyone in the kingdom a piece of coal as big as your fist is saved daily, nearly 8 million tons would be saved in a year. Save your bet. So that was a, a, a call for a, an economical attitude of the people. And the goal was not only to avoid shortage of coal, but also to keep the price of coal rather uh, low in order to, I mean, uh, and, and to, to obtain that you had to limit uh, the demand in coal. We also uh, mentioned the fact that food was rationed. And here you have a couple of documents which refer to this uh, system of rationing uh, in Britain, which was imposed not only in Britain, but in uh, uh, any country uh, at war. That was absolutely logical. And so that, that's an example of how um, the, the, the normal way the economy used to run uh, was changed during the war. Suddenly, the state introduced rules that uh, were not normal in peacetime. And from a more general point of view, during World War I, uh, an economy of war was set up. And in this economy of war, the state played the largest role. And that was, by the way, a challenge to the doctrine of economic liberalism and laissez-faire, which had been uh, uh, a very important um, dimension of the... Uh, functioning of the economy in Britain or in France. During the war, the economy became more state-run. Because the state uh, was a very important buyer, it was the state that provided the armies with what they needed. And uh, consequently, the governments decided that they could have a say in uh, the organization of the economy. For example, the car company Renault in France, which in 1914, as you can see on this table, used to produce cars, trucks, um, and nothing else, uh, had to uh, change its production system in order to provide for what was needed. Less cars, but more trucks, and newly, tanks, uh, plane engines, and very importantly, shells bombs to be dropped on the enemy lines and as you can see on this uh, on this table as well um, 
for uh, for the Renault company and like other companies it was economically a, a, a good deal I mean uh, the activity of the company increased a lot during the war uh, because uh, well, in a way we could say that so much was being destroyed every day that a lot of things had to be produced as well so you can see the size of the factories increased the number of workers has increased as well and uh, in the previous uh, document you could also see that the share of women working in the Renault factories multiplied by 10 uh, one third of the Re Renault workers at the end of the war were women of course there is something uh, clearly logical in that uh, as many men were uh, on the front line the role of women in uh, uh, economy uh, logically increased that's uh, an interesting point because uh, the mobilization of the labor force was also a key issue uh, shortages in workers had to be avoided and so women were often asked to substitute for men in sectors of the economy where they used to be less numerous but not absent like at the head of the farms and in the fields and also very famously in the weapon factories or in uh, transport there is a text uh, which is a good illustration of that it is this speech pronounced by the French President du Conseil, so equivalent of Prime Minister, René Viviani, it was in August 1914. And I will read just a couple of lines in French. Je vous demande de maintenir l'activité des campagnes, de terminer les récoltes de l'année, de préparer celle de l'année prochaine. Vous ne pouvez pas rendre à la patrie un plus grand service. Debout donc, femmes françaises, jeunes enfants, filles et fils de la patrie. Remplacez sur le champ du travail ceux qui sont sur le champ de bataille. Il n'y a pas dans ces heures graves de labeur infime. Tout est grand qui sert le pays. Debout, à l'action, à l'œuvre. Il y aura demain de la gloire pour tout le monde. You may have noted uh, some subtle references to uh, uh, La Marseillaise, the national anthem of France here. It's a very well written speech, but I think these lines are really great illustration of uh, the concept of total war where you can see that the, uh, there is no difference which is being made by uh, the President du Conseil here between workers on the home front and soldiers on the real battlefront. They are part of a same great battle, they are part of the same conflict, that was total war. And so those pictures have become really iconic of uh, this economic dimension of the war. You can see here uh, what we would call in English-speaking countries factory girls. And it is true that uh, uh, by the, the end of the war in Britain, like uh, shown on this picture, 90% uh, of workers in the munition factories were women. But it would be wrong to say that World War I changed everything in the economic role of women. Women were not absent from the economy before. We, women were not even absent from factories. For example, in textile factories, they had always been the most numerous workers. But simply, they, they had to, uh, to play new roles that used to be uh, given to, to men only. War permitted... Uh, two things. War increased the employment rate of married women and that was a change compared to uh, uh, the pre-war period. Even married women had to work now when often in normal time they would have stayed at home uh, for uh, their uh, uh, domestic activities which is a lot of work of course. And moreover the war made the women more visible in society and so, of course, it was one of the factors of the uh, long process of uh, uh, less uh, inequalities between men and women, but only a step, really only a step. Another famous quote to illustrate the role of women is this quote by General Joffre, the leader of the French army in 1915. I have translated it in English. It would do something like, if factory girls stopped working for 20 minutes, the Allies would lose the war. 
en français, si les femmes qui travaillent dans les usines s'arrêtaient 20 minutes, les alliés perdraient la guerre. On this picture, you can see uh, how uh, men's jobs, uh, what was considered to be men's jobs in the field, was also taken by uh, women. Uh, very importantly, women uh, became um, the managers of their farms, and, and that made a lot of difference um, with the with the past. But uh, women were not the only uh, uh, new workers that could be employed in some factories. Because France and Britain were colonial empires, labor force from the colonies was also strongly uh, encouraged uh, when uh, not uh, I mean, uh, uh, forcibly imposed on the people. And uh, we can see here on this uh, uh, picture how uh, some uh, uh, colonial workers uh, from uh, China and Vietnam but here they are from China, were uh, recruited uh, to work in uh, factories uh, in Paris. And uh, one last example of, of total war regarding the, the involvement of, uh, of the economy in the war. In fact, it was more than only the economy that was involved. It was all components of uh, uh, of um, societies and the economy, and in particular science. Uh, the creation of new weapons is maybe the most uh, uh, visible aspect of the involvement of science. But um, there is no better example than scientist Marie Curie, maybe, because uh, she was a woman, so she illustrates well the mobilization of women, but also because she was a prestigious scientist and uh, the war uh, gave uh, her an opportunity to implement uh, her invention of the X-ray uh, that she had designed and she even used that uh, in a, a car that used to travel uh, uh, just behind the front lines to help soldiers, to help uh, the surgeons. Uh, it was really, really important because it helped surgeons to take off bullets and so uh, to limit the number of amputations. Uh, th that's a great example of how um, the, all the strengths of societies were involved in the war. And the last point we need to have a look at is the cultural mobilization. Um, governments launch massive propaganda campaigns in order to convince societies of the necessity to sustain the war effort, to keep motivated. And so, uh, doing so, they promoted what we can call a culture of war. And I would define culture of war as all the ideas and images shared by a society in order to justify its involvement in the war. All the existing media were used. The press, which was strictly controlled by censorship, was asked to convey an optimistic view of the ongoing war, which was largely criticized by French soldiers as being bourrage de crâne. Numerous posters were published, specifically in English-speaking countries, where uh, they were really um, very modern and sometimes uh, really inventive. For example, uh, this one, extremely famous from 1914, from the recruitment campaign in Britain. Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? But there is no unuseful detail on this poster, which is a bit complex actually, because we understand that the girl is asking this to her father. And uh, we also uh, understand that, uh, based on the face of the father, Probably he did not fight the Great War. So the, the story takes place sometimes after the war, so in the future. And uh, obviously this father has acted like a coward because he refused to uh, volunteer. And so um, you can see how moral and effective w could be the arguments used in propaganda here. Um, it's really a, a message which is given about the necessity for the British to fight not only for their country, not only against an enemy, but for their children, for uh, the innocence.
that must be preserved from the danger of the war. And uh, I think the, 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 the idea of um, pride of duty is uh, uh, even more highlighted in this poster by the fact that the son is playing with teen soldiers. Uh, and so maybe he would have been ready to go to war. So really here um, uh, you have moral aspects which are, uh, uh, which are um, used in order to convince people. Pride, but also guilt. If you go and fight, you will be proud of yourself and the nation will be proud of you. If you don't go, then you're a coward and you're guilty of something. You have not done your duty. Another extremely famous poster uh, here from the USA with the same goal to recruit soldiers. But here it played on a totally different type of argument. Very explicitly and in an exaggerated way, this poster is a good illustration of the strategy of demonization of the enemy. Here the propaganda aims to show the Germans as a, an army of barbarians and even more than this, an army of animals or of monsters. This gorilla, which is a monstrous gorilla obviously, he's uh, landing on the uh, American soil in the background, on the other side of this waterway, you can see the ruins of destroyed Europe. Even uh, the cathedral of uh, Reims can be recognized here. And um, this mad brute, as it's written, this monster, is um, wearing a German helmet, a spite helmet, which reads militarism, which was uh, a characteristic which was often uh, um, said about the German government. Uh, it was of course a criticism and the government was blamed for being a militaristic government. And the gorilla is also holding a club which reads Kultur, which is a German word for civilization because the Germans said that they were fighting for their civilization, their Kultur. So here the term Kultur is used in an ironic way. And uh, of course, uh, the message is really exaggerated here because the USA it, uh, were not facing any direct danger. And yet you had to recruit soldiers to go to war. So propaganda used this, um, uh, these moral arguments in order to convince young Americans to go and fight in Europe, uh, thousands of miles away from their homeland. Uh, the last detail of the poster is, of course, the woman, which is uh, carried by the monster. It's difficult to say exactly who she, she, she she's symbolizing. Some people say she's the Statue of, Liber of Liberty, but I don't think it is. I don't think she is the Statue of Liberty. I, I believe she's more a uh, representation of uh, innocence of civilians, of the precariousness of civilians, and so uh, it's a way to say that the Germans are fighting like, like barbarians. So uh, topics were numerous, uh, posters were of very different kinds. Just very quickly, here we have another topic which is uh, the portrait of a hero. Uh, a French soldier who lied about his age in order to start and fight uh, when he was only 15, Jean Corentin Carré. So it's a story that was uh, really uh, promoted by the French propaganda. Uh, and uh, you can really understand that this poster uh, aimed to convince children of the necessity to fight. Uh, and that's an interesting uh, aspect of World War I. The culture of war promoted by the governments often included references to childhood, as if children uh, were involved as much as any other adult in, in the war. These documents here prove that you have uh, a little alphabet based on the war, a postcard showing a young child wearing the uniform and, and even uh, the uh, uh, hero of a famous French comic book, Bécassine, who is obviously uh, spending some of her time uh, on the front line as well. 
uh, historians have discovered that uh, uh, it's as if World War I had invented the child as uh, you know, uh, an important character of society. And it's true that before the uh, 20th century, children were not really considered to have a central role to play in society. Uh, during World War I, children were used as a propaganda topic, symbolizing the innocents being attacked, and so in order to, to present the war as a fair and moral struggle. And they were also a target of the propaganda. So I think this uh, last point is a good symbol of how strong was the government's will to control and reshape public opinion. And from the general point of view, how much indeed World War I uh, was the moment when governments became big governments.